everybody, how are you? This is the, we're in the Thunderdome tonight. Yes. Um, thank you all for coming. This is the first in a series of events that we'll do like this. Uh, we don't know how many, but we'll do a number over the course of this term and uh, in spring term. Um, these are events I'm organizing, and some faculty will be participating as well with, uh, with POSIT. Uh, and you all probably know who they are. I'm going to let them uh, tell you a little bit about what they're doing, and uh, then I will make some more general introductions. But the, the basic format for these will be that we'll have, at least this semester, we have a lot of new faculty, and a lot of you are new students. And we even have new faculty from other schools here. Just, we are so cool here, all the new faculty from the other schools come here. Yeah? So you're in the right place. Yeah. So, uh, in any case, we'll, uh, so the first four or five of these will be uh, ways to introduce you all uh, to uh, some of our new faculty. Um, they'll, they're going to give very short presentations on some of their work. And then we, we, uh, Posit has uh, taken questions online, and they will ask some of those on your behalf, and then we'll open it up to you to ask questions. These aren't going to be long, so they're like maybe an hour, uh, so not super long, but long enough that we can you can you know get some flavor for what these new faculty are doing. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Birani. Are you going to talk? Yeah. Oh, oh, Sarah. Okay, Sarah's going to tell you a little bit about uh, what Posit is. Hi everyone, um, so my name is Sarah Ritchie, um, I'm the editor-in-chief of POSIT. For those of, us, for those of you who haven't checked us out online yet, um, we are an online digital multimedia publication ran by students in the School of Architecture. So we publish anything from GIFs to videos to articles that the students have written related to design and architecture. Um, so one of the kind of main goals of POSIT is to open up conversation in a more accessible way between students and other students or students and faculty. Um, so that's kind of the theme of this event is opening it up to the students and other faculty members and really facilitating conversation. So please tweet us or follow us on Instagram, comment on our Facebook to submit your questions. You can hashtag POSIT live. Um, you can find these cards in the back. They're called Posit Punches. These are for the students. Um, if you attend five events by the end of the semester, or the end of the year, um, you'll get a poster. So please attend our events. Follow us. You didn't tell me about that. No, it's a new thing. Yeah, it. it's Michaela's idea. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dean Speaks, for having us, and enjoy. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. All right. So check, check them out, especially their Instagram. They, they've been doing some really nice interviews. Uh, they'll probably be interviewing uh, most of our speakers for the, for the term. I think they've done. Uh, what's nice is they're, they're, they, they already have their own kind of interview profile. They're, uh, they're all black and white. And they're, on, they're pretty short, so you can get like to the essence of it. How many people have seen them? Did they get, a, did they get two checks on the? Okay. All right, cool. All right. Uh, a little marketing here. Okay, so I'm going to do a, 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 just a general introduction of this of, of this iteration tonight. This is the first one. We'll do many. We'll, we will have faculty doing what I'm doing now later, but we wanted to start this one um, uh, tonight uh, with me. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the two presenters tonight, uh, we selected because they're, they are both Burgosian fellows. Probably none of you know what that is, so I'm going to explain very briefly what that is, um, and and then I'll ask each of them to, to give a short presentation. They're going to present about five, eight, nine, ten minutes. So the Burgosian Fellowship is a fellowship uh, that we started mm, three years ago. We had our first fellow uh, last year, which was Maya, and uh, Linda is our second. And this fellowship uh, was is underwritten by the Burgosian family. Uh, it enables us to bring in a young, uh, a new faculty member uh, to come in and to teach and conduct research for a year with us here. And the, one of the ideas, uh, so, so they typically will teach a studio and they will also teach a seminar. Uh, sometimes one in each semester. This is a, an especially, I think, good event to introduce uh, Linda Chong, who many of you, the new fellow, many of whom, uh, well, you don't, many of you don't know she is, so this is a way to 
to, to, to introduce her. Um, so, but one of the one of the conceits, one of the organizing ideas and principles of the of this fellowship is that uh, the fellow can kind of come in and uh, decide to use a piece of technology or a technique, um, and they use that in their research and in their studios, and uh, they use it exclusively for the year with their students, and then after they use that, then they turn that over to the school. So. It enables us to bring in some new things that we couldn't be doing otherwise with a kind of a specialized uh, group of users uh, that we then uh, spread, uh, spread it out to the rest of the school. Um, so, with that said, I'm going to start uh, with uh, um, asking each of you to make a short presentation, if you will, if you don't mind. Um, uh, so, <laughs> we'll, st <laughs> we'll start with... Um, with Wow, be careful. These are really dangerous here. Do you guys like the red carpet? Isn't this uh, super cool? Yeah, it's great. Fantastic. Okay. I'm going to ask you the first question. So Maya Alam is going to present first. Maya was the fellow last year. Uh, she's going to make a presentation. And then Linda Chong, the fellow this year, is going to make a presentation. And then I will ask Maya a question. Go ahead. You did, you did Maya? Yeah. Okay. I hate holding these and talking. It's just too much coordination for me. Um, all right. So, just to give you guys a heads up, we've been asked for these presentations that we just spontaneously, really quick, threw together um, to talk a little bit about our background or how did you call it? Professional practices and current research interests. So, um, as the first slide, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> I guess in this format of the new faculty thing, I'm the senior faculty, which is <laughs> kind of amazing. Um, so just background-wise, um, more, education more or less, um, I guess, linear, although on both, on two ends of the spectrum. So I studied, um, interior design, interior architecture, and sort of like building and existing conditions uh, in Düsseldorf at the Peter Behrens School of Architecture. And then um, I did my grad education at SciArc in Los Angeles. And in terms of work, it was even, even, I guess, less linear, but maybe more on the same side of the spectrum. But um, I Probably, we discussed this before, I probably was not allowed to show all of these, but they're so quick, so they're not showing. Um, but yeah, just to, just to give you kind of an overview, like if, I worked on a bunch of sort of like, um, in, in little studios, and bigger, in bigger offices, like my studio. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, see, that's why I don't like my um, and, and it ranges from uh, sort of, yeah, artwork to spatial um, installations, um, public installations, uh, expo pavilions towards like high-end interior design and crazy pavilions. And this last one is actually um, a version of uh, affordable housing in Brooklyn. <laughs> so research, interests are kind of all over the place and not really so um, we actually my my partner in crime um, we, we actually gave a lecture for the high school students uh, this summer that um, Molly and Brad curated and we put a couple of words together that starts to frame our interest but also starts to sort of interconnect with each other so it's really again not a linear necessarily linear process um, but in general it has something to do with how can we look at um, new media and, and um, how it affects our perception and um, how do we relate to it in terms of uh, ideas of new materialism, or um, even further, how do we how do we translate it back into the world, especially when we're dealing with existing conditions? So how do we um, start understanding uh, 
things like that we look at every day, which is pretty much flat on the screen, into back into the world that surrounds us. Uh, really just quickly shout out to my students. <laughs> Uh, put together a bunch of um, images from student work from Syracuse, which, I mean, yeah, in general, I think the, the research that I've been, I've been doing and conducting the last couple of years, especially during the fellowship, was really just possible because you guys are geniuses. Um, and then I, I do have images of depending on if I'm running out of time or not, I do have images of the work from last year. Somebody came up to me, I think it was David Shanks, I don't know if he's here. Uh, maybe not, maybe he left because he was actually really excited that I would show stuff from the exhibition and I show anything but stuff from the exhibition. <laughs> I thought you all saw that already. But I, yeah, I have that in case. Um, but really I'm just showing two projects that uh, we worked on this year and they're sort of like work in progress still. One is called Streetscape, that was a um, sort of a revitalization project in, um, in downtown Syracuse where um, we were asked to put up a couple of installations um, in, in empty storefronts to sort of um, revitalize um, the, the image of the city and what we started to do was um, use the um, digital scans that um, were produced based on um, studies that, that Daniela already did and um, created sort of like a thickened fabric for it that we then projected back onto these facades and when you see the close-ups it's really also about sort of the reflection between yeah, I don't want to say real, because to me they're both real. But a uh, reflection between the environment that it, that it's surrounded by at that moment and the environment that we created through the digital media. And then the last one, I mean, it's really also work in progress right now, but it's um, based on a prompt, uh, based on a grant that we want for the summer, where we're um, looking at um, a prompt that was brought out by uh, the Italian government to look at um, ruins that are, that are pretty much off the beaten track, so they're just standing, standing by themselves right now, and um, the, the Italian government is asking for revitalization prompts for these things to start to um, yeah, revisit what kind of um, slow tourism tracks there could be. And we're taking a little bit, again, um, an idea of the digital and starting to create sort of um, more of a thicker fabric for it. So we started documenting in a more informal way that is closer to, um, yeah, the sort of Instagram thing. Um, to something that can be used for, for documenting the site towards actually producing, yeah, an actual buildable fabric. If, I'm just gonna switch to my website real quick because I didn't put that together. <laughs> and, no! Just, and I'm still in time, sort of. How am I doing? How am I doing on time? <laughs> Just, you know. Um, so we shot a bunch of videos for uh, what we... Mm -hmm. um, give me a second. Um, yeah, run. Um, we shot a bunch of videos that sort of documented the installation we did in, um, in the marble room just behind us, but also in a way to start to document an idea that, that came out of this, which is um, how do you create a new kind of materialism out of looking at screens, um, producing 3D prints that obviously have a lot to do with, um, with materiality as well, or to me, obviously. Um, and then how do you start blending those in with the material that is in the existing or in the site 
that in this case was just like the marble rooms. Thank you, you're done. Uh, no, actually, j just to say, uh, one of the, what the, some of the tools that Maya used last year, and they were, the products are evident in the exhibition, were paper 3D printers, um, and they're used pretty extensively. We're talking, uh, we're discussing right now with um, uh, another future exhibitor in there, and this is a really super, incredibly challenging space to put together a show, the Marble Room. And I think you guys did really an amazing job of just grabbing it and kind of reinventing it. It's a, it's a chest. The surfaces are very hard. Um, it's marble. Um, everything is the same. Um, so it's a, it's a real challenge. But uh, it, was a, it was a great exhibition, a great show. And we can talk more about that later. Um, next, uh, we have Linda Chung, who's going to talk about what she started to do. Linda's own, this semester, Linda is teaching a seminar. Some, people, some of you may be in that. How many people are in the ceramic seminar? Anybody? Oh, okay, good. So, um, wow, you're, you should have good questions. Yeah. Of course, okay. So, um, uh, anyway, Linda is teaching a seminar this semester, and then next semester, another one, and a studio. So, I'm not exactly, I know what she does very well, but uh, she's going to tell us a little bit about her, her research, and she's going to tell us maybe about the studio for next semester or not, or whatever, but Linda Chong, the new Bergosian College. Lazor, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here. And I'm looking at, I don't, I don't recognize um, a lot of faces out there, so I've only met some of you. So if I have not met you, please come up to me and just introduce yourself. I would love to meet you. Um, yeah, so it's great to be here. Um, so I'm coming uh, here from Berlin, um, where I've been the last few years uh, working for Barca Leibinger Architects um, and an artist, Olaf Um And um, basically, when I was own research interests, um, which do work a lot with materiality, um, are invested in um, the production of memory, identity, heritage, um, and trying to move away from a sort of stable, static, definable um, definition of those terms, um, which involves kind of really asking the question of um, how do we remember, how do we go from individual memories to form shared memories, um, how are those reified. Um, so while I was in uh, Berlin, I also did um, uh, artist residency for uh, half a year at the Center of um, Art and Urbanistics um, with a collaborator, Tyler Fox, um, who is an um, anthropologist. She works a lot with um, life histories, oral histories as well. Um, so she, when we were there together, we did this, uh, a series of um, memory clinics, trying to sort of grapple with these questions with kind of 50 to 75 participants each time. Um, and in, in this instance, the screen's over there. Um, in this instance, uh, we were having um, people pair off with strangers um, in, in the age range from 8 until 70. Um, and um, we had them try to pinpoint um, a shared memory around the theme of Y2K. Of course, not all of them were alive uh, or born yet, um, but still had uh, memories of this time. And then we asked them um, to, with plaster, um, to sort of try to represent a shared version of that memory. Um, so in this case, you know, that actually went pretty smoothly. I think when you're two people, it's, you, it's still possible to create um, a shared memory between two, but this starts to become more complicated when you start to bring in uh, more people, more voices, um, more um, heterogeneity. And so that was kind of each clinic we did was kind of getting larger. Um, and so it, when, it, when you get to a collective, um, and I don't have the answers for these questions yet that I'm still asking, um, of course, um, how do you constitute that collective? And more importantly, how do you constitute the subject as part of that? So these are um, questions that I will be kind of grappling with still over um, the next year and probably many years to come. Um, so working with these moments of irresolution and contradiction in, in, in kind of these moments of, of um, uncertainty, I think it, it gives the possibility um, to approach the question of memory um, a bit differently. Uh, and so one of the methods that I, I tend to use um, in my design, um, design thinking, I guess you could call it, um, 
is this kind of indirect communication, which I'm sure my students have heard me uh, say a lot already this semester, um, and it's as a means of getting at the real. Um, and so specifically um, with this fellowship, the process that I want to work with is a, mat a material and time-based design process. Um, so we're going to be looking at, throughout this year, including the semester, iterative casting. Um, so we'll be exploring the inherent properties in that material process um, that lend themselves to explore these ideas. Um, so you know, mold, trace, negation, positive, negative, decay, erosion, these are all things that are just inherent in the way you deal with it. Um, and dealing with materiality and just um, having to think about what steps you take um, as you go through these processes. Um, and so I think it, it opens you up to thinking um, through design, thinking through making, um, that may lead you towards other possibilities that m might not necessarily um, come so naturally uh, if you're just thinking. Um, and so it's really about um, trying to carry out ideas at both a theoretical and practical level um, together without disruption between the two, um, and that thinking through making and, and making through thinking can enrich each other. I, I get to ask the first question of each, and then uh, pause it. Um, we'll take over after that. Uh, my question really to, is, to my, <laughs> to my is, um, you did use, uh, I mean, we talked a lot about this, and then we were, we purchased it, and you had used 3D, paper 3D printers before. We didn't have one here, and we, we purchased one, and subsequently have another one on the way. Maybe could you tell us a little bit about why you wanted to do that, what you did with it, and, and um, now what's possible with that here at the school? Yeah. Uh. Um, I mean, in, in terms of in terms of what's possible for the school, I think it, it one one important thing that I discussed with with um, uh, a lot of people from the faculty is. Um, how do you break out of the, the modernist, super white, um, pristine model that is beautiful, but that also belongs to a very particular time? How do you start um, negotiating more than one, um, one material in terms of, and, and not only in terms of what the material actually is, like in, in the case of uh, ceramics, but also in terms of image? So one of the main things that um, that this technology does, and relatively cheap in comparison to um, how you would do it with, with a powder color printer, is um, connecting the idea of, of texture, of, of images that we're looking at with, um, with the digital and ultimately putting it back into, um, into reality and actually starting to understand ideas of um, three-dimensionality and flatness through that. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll start. We'll start with that. I'll, I'll, and then they have hundreds of questions. I yeah. think, or, or at least fifteen or so. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I'll, uh, Linda. Since we, since you haven't done your exhibit yet, and we are just beginning to see what you're doing. Um, uh, I mean, the topic you're working on uh, is one that kind of has come and gone in architecture, but. Um, the questions around memory and monuments and the extent to which uh, buildings or pieces of sculpture or you know, any kind of physical structure um, bears, uh, let's say, well, um, uh, holds on to or hangs on to memories or memories reside in that or creates responses is, is obviously very much uh, a top is a topic that's very much in the air these days. It's a, it's a politically charged topic, obviously, but it's also it's a philosophical uh, issue. And I know uh, part of your part of some of the discussions we've had about the symposium that you'll organize in the spring revolves around, let's say, this return to an interest in the real, but not so much authenticity in a, let's say, an old-fashioned sense. Could maybe, that's a lot of questions, but could you say something 
about maybe where you're going with the research, with uh, especially around memory and, and where the symposium might go? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, um, you know, with the, the if you start with um, kind of the history of phenomenology um, and how it's been appropriated into architecture and in the 60s and the or sort of original aims of architectural phenomenology um, in that time to kind of um, counter the sort of modern uh, industrialization, modern technology that kind of took away this wholesome experience. So it be, it's a very different kind of memory then. So it becomes phenomenology and philosophy was used by architecture to kind of um, regain access to a wholesome experience again, to refine unity um, and coherence in this very classical sense. Um, and then, of course, um, the next generation of still phenomenologists, or archite architectural phenomenologists, I should say, critiques that. Um, and they start to question um, the foundations that were unexamined um, from Western Enlightenment. Um, and they look for discontinuities. And, and they sort of set up the ground for post-structuralism. Um, and so all of these different um, different, uh, I don't know, in architectural theory and discourse have been addressing memory um, for some time already. And then at some point um, with postmodernism, it's become cliche. But somehow, um, now it's, it's obviously back again. But I also think there is, um, there is definitely like a, a, retur like a return of, of the real, but in a, in a really new and strange way, um, of which I'm still figuring out. I just read this, um, I, I just received um, and read um, this really great um, article by Hal Forst Foster, 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 um, that came out just in April, and it's called um, Real Fictions. And he's basically positioning that you know today there's such a new type of real that's emerging and, and reframing it. Um, and so I think this is is definitely um, in the air. Um, and so and I think we, we in this time now um, we think about after everything that's happened. Um, we think about memory, and we think about the real, and we approach these things in such different ways. Um, and we also approach, you know, phenomenology in a, di in a different way. Um, and so I think in, with with this um, with the symposium and the courses, um, I'm trying to kind of figure out, you know, what is, how does this all fit together now in this kind of new version of of what we think memory is? Um, so how does how do we use feeling and experience and intuition again, but not to create this kind of um, classical coherence and unity and wholesome experience? Because we all don't, we all recognize um, that authenticity is a construct, um, and so it's identity. And you, you know, if you could, how do you construct yourself? How is that related to the other? So all of these things um, we've now taken, but all the, a lot of explorations in those things have not been. Um, They've been kind of divided from this, this kind of more uh, intuitive um, aspect. Um, and so the exploration with um, material is kind of trying to get back to that sort of, there's a feeling, there's intuition in it. It can address um, these discontinuities um, and, and these instabilities. Um, so there's kind of, um, they're trying to explore what that means, um, yeah, through thinking through making, basically. I don't know if that answers. Of course it did. Yes, fantastic. Um, no, that was a great answer. Uh, uh, just to just to reiterate, in the spring, um, as as Maya did last spring, uh, Linda will organize a, a symposium and invite probably speakers from the university and from outside to address some of these issues, and we look forward to that. So, with that, I'll thank you both for your answers, and then I'll turn it over uh, to Birani and uh, you guys. Do what you like with it. It's yours. So I'll have to turn it over to Remy. <laughs> yes. OK. So we're just going to run through some of the submitted questions. Uh, what Pause is trying to do is make a more accessible platform for conversation. And there's nothing worse than a lecture with no Q&A. So we kind of uh, curated a little bit of a Q&A here. And then we can open up at the end for questions, extra questions. So first one, this is for you, Linda. Last year's fellowship exhibition included work in collaboration with students. Is this imperative to your, I'm assuming, PE exploration? PE. PE, I, yeah. I <laughs> yes, definitely. So, um, the, I mean, the, the exhibition is an exhibition of, of the research um, produced throughout the, the year here. Um, and so for me, that is to be done with 
together with the students through teaching um, through the class. So they go definitely hand in hand. So next question is for Maya. Um, if you were in Linda's position, just starting your fellowship, what would you do differently? Um, no, nothing and, and everything really. I mean, I would probably um, be less, less nervous and um, less scared that whatever comes out does not make any sense. Um, but ultimately, I think I think the the um, that and and researching as as everyone who's right now in peace knows is is part of of um, the deal. Really, you're you're producing something. You're working with students. You're 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 bouncing ideas where you don't have answers to, which is nerve wracking. But that's also what makes it interesting. So I don't I don't think I. I wouldn't do anything differently, really. Next question. Uh, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you cannot screw up anyway. So. Uh, so, I guess both of you can answer this. When did you realize you wanted to teach architecture to students? <laughs> I'm letting you go first because you've been teaching longer than me. <laughs> so, um, maybe a little bit anecdotal, but um, I, I mean, I'm, uh, for people who, who know me, I'm not necessarily enjoying events like this, because I don't necessarily like to be in the center of attention. Uh, so when I started grad school, I still sometimes feel like that was, that was my dream job, where I was just in the library and reading rare books. And one of my professors that I actually ended up co-teaching a vertical studio here, um, Marcelo Spina, sort of, I think in, in his way it was um, a friendly suggestion, but as an Argentinian it's um, pretty much saying what the, <laughs> what the plan is. So he really um, got me into it and um, and told me that's the way to do it. And ultimately, um, I, I realized how right he was, how, how um, different my, my thoughts become by just interacting with, with others. Um, I guess for me, it was, it probably started uh, when I started doing internships <laughs> um, and realizing that I probably was having more fun in school. Um, <laughs> so I think it had been on my mind um, since I graduated already. Um, but I had the feeling that I did need to go um, into practice and kind of see how it is, how it's working, and understand it. Um, and so I, I did do that. And I was lucky to have, I was fortunate to um, work um, in places uh, that are doing a lot of research actually still compared to um, a lot of other, I've had very great opportunities um, in the places I've worked and the projects I've worked on. Um, so that's been really, really fun. Um, but um, yeah, then I decided that, that I was, um, I wanted to explore this side as well, so. I was also at Sikus TA <laughs> in ceramics. <laughs> All right, so the next question um, can, I think, be both for both of you guys as well. Um, how did your career before becoming an architecture professor affect the way you instruct students? And I'll let you guys decide who goes first. Try. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I think, I think in both of our cases, aside from that I got um, friendly suggested slash forced into, into teaching during, during grad school, um, the, the Argentinian way. Um, I, I, it was important for me to, to go into practice and to get uh, work experience and to see um, what's out there and, and how, um, how young architects or established architects operate in the world and how they start tackling problems. And, um, I, I had this question a couple of times in terms of um, 
how, how did these people influence your work? I don't think it's actually about, um, at least in my case, not so much about, about mentorship, but it's more about um, learning certain processes of, of, of working and certain methodologies of working, and then um, being able to, to convey those to your students in, and I mean, in the most simple way, it's in, in my class, it's really also about keeping deadlines, something super banal, but it becomes something <laughs> second nature if you actually work in a, in a professional environment. So um, kind of um, forcing that on my students and, and, um, and, and allowing them to to push against that, but also have a discussion about what that means in the real world. My, my answer is just going to be a, bit, a little general, maybe too oversimplified. But um, I guess for me, I'm trying to teach things, um, instruct things that I couldn't do or you wouldn't find in practice. Um, so it's kind of taking um, advantage of the opportunities here. I mean, the course we're, we're doing this semester is, is with ceramics. Um, we've been very lucky um, to get access to the ceramic facilities. Um, this, the ceramics program there at School of Art have been really amazing um, and generous about that. Um, so there's this you know, opportunity to do all of these things that um, don't necessarily usually lie traditionally within the field of architecture and often if you are in um, working in practice you wouldn't get to do. I strangely did do ceramics um, and was throwing on a wheel when I was in an architecture office, but that's definitely the exception. Uh, that's not normal. Um, so I think it's mostly that it's influenced me to sort of um, use the opportunity to investigate things that um, you guys won't get to do um, elsewhere than specifically here. One from this, because it's three questions, which is too many for right now. Um, so we'll do the first one. What aspects of your academic journey were most enjoyable or impressionable on you? <laughs> I, I, I'm, yeah, the fact that I cannot pick one, I think, is is actually one of the aspects. I think the the fact that um, me as sort of the aggressive introvert can sit <laughs> in, what did you call it? Um, the, sun, the Thunderdome right now and, and talk about my ideas and sort of convey what I'm, uh, what I'm thinking about and discussing certain, certain ideas is, is really that as an accumulation. Like, I did, like things like that, that symposium that I put together really, um, um, yeah, let me let me grow as a person, but also let me understand how I can position myself with others. Um, for me, it was thesis. Um, I know thesis is not for everyone, um, but that was um, definitely the the most fun I had, um, and also really changed um, the trajectory of the things that I investigate and things I think about. Um, it was amazing to finally just have enough time to read all of these things that I was interested in, not knowing how, what they would lead into, but you know, there's just a pile of, of words and concepts that, that were fascinating. And I could finally dive into it and, and figure out why, um, and then figure out why they seem to have a resonance to architecture, and just yeah, had fun and play around with it. Um, so that was the best thing for me. <laughs> Is technology just a means of production in your work, or does it have a more integral role in your work? Anonymous. What do you mean by technology? Um, yeah. What you, I mean, it depends on what you mean by technology. Really, one one is a one is a tool. The other one is something that that is just so much part of our reality today that it um, is just us really and it affects the way we we see ourselves or uh, or others or the world so i don't i guess yes it is an integral part but i i also think everyone who operates in this world does that so 
if it's just technology in general. Yeah, I'm kind of of the same position, so I don't really have much to add. Okay, so we can open it up then. Yeah, thanks. Um, especially leading off of the last question, because uh, reading the two, you know, the two research projects, um, I, Maya's, yours definitely seems like um, a, a, what I would call like a digitally dependent practice, uh, um, a digital, ba digitally based practice. Like you're very interested in technology and how technology furthers some of the ideas that you're working with and the relationship between so you will those explain to me more technology what do you mean by technology no i i'm, I'm saying specifically digital fabrication technology like digital. everything digital or digital fabrication the computer uh social media the screen electricity like i i'm i'm very specifically talking about uh, digital fabrication technology in in uh, in um, in architectural applications um, and and in, in, in Linda, in your work, it seems to be that um, that the digital is kind of is, is kind of like a, 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 an aside or just kind of a, a process or a tool that's getting you to something that's much more about the material itself or the, the quality of the material, the processes in the material, and how you talk about it is much more about it's less about the the the, the technologic the, the digital technology but more about the technology of, of making the thing. Um, and, and you're working with a material that's like 20,000 years old, so um, it's a kind of a different relationship. Yes and no. Um, I don't really know how to phrase any of this. Um, yeah, I mean, slip casting is also a technology if you want to include technique into technology, like, however we want to talk about it. Um, so, you know, that's I, I would I would be you know just as interested in you know if you um, continuously three D scanned an object and printed it um, how it would decay. Um, it, but it, to me, it's it's not the difference that one is digital and then one is is, is not that that matters. Um, so the, the distinction is kind of um, is not the point. So you could, all of, by all means all of those things can be incorporated. In we're doing we're using digital things also in the, in the course and I use it in my in my work as well, um, but yeah, it's not, it, yeah, it's kind of more of a process, I guess. Um, I also think it's not helpful to, to make a distinction between what is digital and what is not, and having then a conversation about what is what is real and what is not, <laughs> I mean, because we're all, I, I mean, we're, we're, it's not it's not that one of us, are using, like, it, it's not the time where, um, Greg Lynn was sitting somewhere in at Yale in his in a studio and was building his own computer and everyone else was building analog models. Like we're not there. Like we've all been introduced to computers. We're all using them. We're all using them to a different degree. Maybe my research right now looks at how we're using it um, and how that is is part of our lives. But really, we're we're all using it. Like I mean, the fact that these are are GIFs and, and the, the multiple images are creating sort of a texture and, and sort of an environment for themselves based on the digital photos that you took off, off that material. It creates a new digital, creates a new materialism, really. So um, I, I think it's in general just like the, the distinction between real and digital, I think is just holding you back. Okay, excellent. Um, more questions? Clara? So, I have a loud voice. Okay. <laughs> no, no, we can actually we need it on the... You stay there. <laughs> question? <laughs> My question regards the fellowship and what pursued you to do a fellowship and why this one in particular, basically for both of you. Um, I mean, as I was explaining before, um, teaching was always kind of in the in the back of my mind when I graduated and was going um, to work. So um, the fellowship was 
that was a thing on my mind. Um, so that's kind of, uh, it, it makes um, the most sense as a sort of um, natural transition into teaching because all of a sudden you need to figure out how to do research, you need to figure out how to teach all at once. Um, and the fellowship is an amazing opportunity for that um, because you actually get supported to do the research. Um, you're not just being asked um, to teach, so you actually really have the opportunity to learn how to do research through teaching. Um, so that's really amazing um, for someone like me in my um, you know, early start of my career. Um, and um, why specifically Syracuse? I mean, one is, is um, of course, you guys have an amazing student body. You have an amazing reputation, um, which is definitely proving to be true with my students. Um, but the other was Michael. <laughs> Um, so we've had some, some great conversations and I think, uh, you know, a lot of the times that I've, I've, um, I show my work or I talk about my work, I have to filter what kind of person that I'm presenting to. I have to decide if either they are into making or they're into thinking. And I only present one half of it because the other half is like terribly boring and irrelevant to them. Um, and um, with Michael that wasn't true. Um, he, he kind of got, or Dean speaks, I should say, sorry. Um, that, that's, um, I'm still getting used to the, the sort of proper, proper formalities here. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so, and, and then I also got the sense that then that must also be in the air of the school. Um, and I've been finding also with my class, my students, that, this, that that's true. Um, so it's, it's, I don't think that's um, so common. I haven't found that in a lot of places and with a lot of people I've met. Um, so that's been really great, um, and I think that for that reason it will be an amazing um, place to develop my work over the next year. I don't know if I can top that. Um, I mean, yeah, one, one reason is that I was already here, right? So um, the, the first year they, they really um, just ran it um, between um, a couple of young faculty that um, sort of as a, as a, as a call to, um, to do something where we didn't really know what it was yet, uh, which I think was one of the intriguing things about that and, and continues to be one of the intriguing things about it, that he, you're actually, um, it's a huge opportunity to, to um, everything that Linda said, on top of that, um, I think it's, it's an incredible opportunity to work on a fellowship that hasn't been really established yet. So actually working um, with students and administration, Michael and Julia, um, and, and really also the, the donor who's, who's still alive, who's amazing, Paula, um, to, to figure out what that means for Syracuse University, which I think is, um, in most cases, at least in, in American academia, something that's already there. So um, it's really a rare opportunity that, that we just have. So we have you digitally um, captured. The digital Let's just say here. something really rude. <laughs> then I'll, uh, Linda, this question is honestly for you. Uh, we know each other already, so this is interesting. I just didn't realize that you did work in or at least are familiar with phenomenology, and I'm much interested, my research is in the intersection between phenomenology and race, right? So I'm interested in how this question of memory is being translated into architectural phenomenology, right? So there's this, anyway, but just, yeah, how, how was memory phenomenology and architecture being translated uh, in your own work or just in general? Because I'd love to see. Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to have to have yes. a lot more conversations. Oh, <laughs> lot, yeah, I won't say that. Um, so I, one of the things is, um, you know, with, with this kind of early phenomenology or architectural phenomenology, which is different from phenomenal, phenomenology itself, um, that tries to produce this kind of wholesome experience and this stabilization and this unifying, um, this leads to this kind of stabilized version of memory that I'm trying to avoid. Um, and what that leads to is, um, you know, these things like UNESCO um, and these kind of um, capital N narratives, these kind of state narratives that are singular and unifying. Um, and of course, to be powerful, um, to, to have a sort of national narrative um, or a national identity, of course, um, it does need to have kind of this like one-liner unifying thing, um, a, a stable kind of thing to, to grapple with and, and be moving. 
Um, but that, if you, you have one stable, singular, universalizing thing, you're of course then transgressing a whole bunch of other, um, of other voices, other bodies. Um, and so that's kind of something that um, then becomes uh, problematic. So there's a lot of people kind of looking at kind of what's called bottom-up heritage now. Um, and somehow I don't like a lot of it. Um, it somehow feels um, very similar. So it's kind of just taken, it just literally thinks, okay, what is top down? Let me invert it, then it's bottom up. Um, but it's not re-examining um, any of the underlying core foundational um, elements. Um, and so that's something I'm, I'm, I'm like, I have no idea what the answer is. This is what I'm trying to, what I hope to figure out also um, throughout this year. Um, and so this is, I'm sure, something that you, we should have lots of conversations with, because I'm sure you're much more familiar. Um, but, you know, the, the, um, there's been a lot of critique of phenomenology and um, the sort of fixed um, singular subject um, that is at the base of it that then obviously produces these things. So if we quest question this fixed subject, um, which, I mean, you guys have had this symposium with psych liberalism here um, that tries to replace that by um, looking at um, sort of non-human and objects as well. Um, but you know, another way to look at it is if you replace the fixed subject with, um, if you look, at, if, if the fixed subject could not be this kind of whole um, sort of grounded dwelling from Heidegger, um, and you know, if the subject is necessarily founded based on the other, um, or if you look at this kind of Hegelian master-slave dialectic, um, what kind of subjectivity does that produce in, in phenomenology? And I don't know, like I have so much more to read before I can even try to attempt to translate this in, into architecture, um, but this is kind of, uh, yeah, what I'm, some of, some of the many, lots of sporadic things I'm trying to grapple with. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, so it's for Linda, I'm very interested in materials, um, I worked for a concrete company this summer under material research and design, um, but for me materials, I guess we think about it very differently, well I think, you know, um, to me materials is much more about uh, what, the, what are the properties of materials and how does it perform, what can you do with it, and then what are, what, how does it link to the built environment. Uh, so I was focusing more on the performance of the material. How does it perform under certain conditions like rain, uh, sun, or things like that. And then when you start explaining with ceramics, I just, uh, it's kind of like a hard link for me to link doing studies with ceramics and how do you apply that to a large scale built environment. And also the time, I guess that variable is always there. Even for my exploration, it gets built Time will be there and it will affect the concrete in a certain way. So I'm just wondering what the transition or the link is between doing ceramic studies and adding variables. How does that relate to architecture, large structures? And what are your goals and what do you hope to accomplish with this material exploration with ceramics? That's a really great question and it's actually one of the questions, one of the like main questions that I set out for myself um, with this fellowship. So. Um, the kind of easy answer um, I'll, I'll give you first, and then the kind of I don't know yet answer um, that I hope to explore through the exhibition, I'll give you after. So the easy answer um, is, uh, so I also came to doing material fabrication from this more performative technical side. Um, and so, but I always had uh, these sort of other interests, and so, but I've, com I've kind of combined them, right? So. Um, I'm using materiality um, at a kind of more um, conceptual level um, for kind of, um, you know, if you think about it more on like a one to two hundred scale um, of exploring like ideas. Um, so the slipcasting in the class is kind of more exploring ideas, not to like literally take it and then build it at like one to one scale later. But that being said, um, that I'm, I'm aware of that. And then the next question is, okay, well, if there's all these sort of memory um, aspects in, in um, casting that I want to play with, um, you should be able to build with those one-to-one -one as well. So, if, but if you scale up, it's not, ch it, you know, it, it changes everything. Um, so actually, how would, you, how would you scale that up? What would that look like? What ramifications would that have um, in, in terms of thinking as well? 
Um, so that's um, one of the things that is, is one of the main things I'm thinking about as I'm trying to plan for the exhibition in the spring, actually. So you'll see if I manage or not. <laughs> so maybe with the exhibition, I'll finally answer your question. <laughs> more, more questions? Nothing more? Okay. Okay. Oh, wait. <laughs> um, I know that a lot of phenomenology is linked to um, the view and what you see, but um, I don't know why it's just the personal thing for me. I, I like to tap out materials and how light, um, not how rain um, or our footsteps, um, what, what we hear about materials. Is that part of research too? about um, how, what, what sounds does the material make as you step onto it or ring taps onto it? Is that? I, I think that is still very much part of um, phenomenology, so it's, it's all sensorial um, experience. Um, I, I don't, I, I use that to kind of position the sort of history of how um, sort of architecture started thinking about memory and history um, and the real and the, these kind of concepts. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, my like position is in architectural phenomenology. Um, I think it's it's. I, I'm still figuring out very much where exactly in, on all of the scales that I stand. Um, but I, I am um, I am interested in kind of feeling an emotion um, that I think that's a very powerful form of, of knowledge um, that you can access things that you just cannot figure out until much later through those. And um, these things are describing like the sound and the footsteps, like these do contribute to this kind of more intuitive feeling. So this kind of intuition um, that is kind of beyond explainable, communicable things um, is definitely part of, um, part of the work that I'll, I'm doing. I don't know, I can't give you an answer um, with exactly where I stand in terms of phenomenology per se. Could, could I maybe just say something maybe that links both of these, because it's an answer to your question. So uh, a lot of Linda's work, as she's alluded to, um, uh, is about a re-examination of the use of phenomenology in architecture, yeah? And really it's had two or three historical periods. Early on, a lot of the, uh, Space Time in Architecture, for example, is one of the most famous books in, our, in, in architectural history theory. It's a book based on a new kind of subject that's emerging and driving a car. Yeah? Uh, and it's about experience. And one of, the, one of the reasons architects became interested in phenomenology early on is because of the things you're talking about, that it gives you a kind of an authentic experience of, of an object. And, uh, let's say uh, a centered subject has an authentic experience of a place, a room, and time. Yeah. Uh, but what happens, let's say, in the 1960s is, uh, in the 70s is there, there emerges a whole digital world where it's not about fabrication, but it's about representation. So for example, if you look at, if you look at what it used to mean to be an authentic architect in the Beaux-Arts school, it meant you had to go to a building, right? You had to travel to a building and touch and smell and taste it. But what started to happen in the 60s and the 70s is we had a lot of new kinds of publications. So people would now see a book and actually, that would be a new kind of experience of that, let's say, building, that architecture. In fact, if I were to ask you, what are your five favorite buildings, I would bet you've not been to them. And yet, they're your favorites, right? Why? Because you've seen them um, in magazines or on television or in films or whatever. So, we have a, so what happens is a whole different way of experiencing things, right? And this coincides in architecture with the introduction of semiotics. Right, the introduction of signs and, symbol, and sign systems, so that the argument was you could no longer authentically experience things. In fact, authenticity itself is very much called into question. Um, and what we have is a world now of images uh, where everything is inauthentic in a sense. And, and we've come to a place in time where people are very bored with the idea that we can't experience things authentically. And so the challenge I think of, let's say, this interest, this new interest in phenomenology is how can we have an experience of a building, a column, a carpet, or whatever that is real, but that's not authentic in an old-fashioned sense. 
this may not make some sense to you what I'm about to say, but the early, early readings of phenomenology are based on people like Martin Heidegger, who was a Nazi, right? And now we have a lot of discussion about that. I mean, this, the real, this guy was a real Nazi, yeah? Okay, so, so when, when you are able to make claims about absolute universal authenticity, yeah, based on soil and things like that, this is ours, then, then people make those claims and they become very dangerous. Yeah. So there are real reasons that authenticity in that old sense are very dangerous. So we have to be very careful about what we mean about phenomenology today. So, quite, so what the challenge is, is it possible to develop uh, a sensibility where we can experience things that are real but are not necessarily authentic in that old-fashioned sense, but that also are not simply representations? That's the, that's the that's part of the that's part of the new kind of challenge, and, and it's I think that's what connects both of this work. That's why when Maya was asked about her work being digital, I mean, if you were to go to that uh, installation they did, uh, it doesn't matter how it was produced. It was an absolutely tactile experience. When you when you look at the things that they produced and they patched on those walls, they covered over and made opaque real marble with real new marble produced digitally, but what is it produced digitally? So, so it's an experience, yes, but uh, just because it's produced in a certain kind of way doesn't mean it's any more or less authentic. And I think, I, I, I think that's part of what Linda's work is about and why it's very exciting. So with that speech, I will end and thank you all. So we will have, uh, we will have a number of these, I don't know how many, uh, we will have uh, so, so new faculty, uh, faculty who are not new, uh, we'll pair people in different kind of ways, but the idea is to work with POSIT, uh, who are doing such a great job with their publication and also just organizing this um, uh, to, to bring more of these kind of talks to you so that we can have these kind of conversations. So I want to thank the speakers. Yeah, my, my, my. For, uh, for organizing and putting all this together and assembling the red carpet and the chairs that we sit in. Um, and I think, is, did AIA do the coffee? Is this the coffee? No, sorry. Oops. <laughs> Unwind that. Um, we did the coffee. Uh, I think somebody did. In any case, thank you all. Thank everybody for coming. We'll uh, stay tuned. We'll do more of these. Thank you.